Our oceans, lakes and rivers are precious. We are at a turning point for our oceans. The next 10 years represent a critical opportunity to accelerate international efforts and achieve the goal of sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. That's why this year's State of World Fisheries and Aquaculture report is focused on sustainability in action. The report highlights major trends in global fisheries and aquaculture and also scans the horizon for new and emerging strategies to better manage aquatic resources sustainably into the future. The sector is at the core of Sustainable Development Goal 14, which calls for the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans, seas and marine resources. Progress is being achieved, but challenges remain. While 65.8% of fish stocks are harvested sustainably, the remaining 34.2% are overfished. Fisheries management is therefore more crucial than ever. Totaling 179 million tonnes, fisheries alone reached 96.4 million tonnes, while aquaculture production reached 82.1 million tonnes, or even more if you include aquatic algae. This is good news for the billions of people who rely on fish as a primary source of protein, and the millions who earn their livelihood working in fisheries and aquaculture. Women play an important role in this labour force, especially in the post-harvest sector. Beyond the nutrition and employment benefits, fish has also become one of the most traded commodities in the world in recent decades, with developing countries taking on an increasingly important role in this arena. As such, fisheries and aquaculture have an indispensable function in society that we simply cannot take for granted. The world must work together to ensure that the generations to come can continue to access this vital source of nutrition and employment, especially as the population continues to grow and global production continues to intensify. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. A big thank you and welcome to the uh, aquaculture program of Asian Institute of Technology, the AARM, what we call the Aquaculture and Aquatic Resources Management Program, which started in the 1980s. Uh, as many of you may know, the ARM program of AIT is one of the pioneer postgraduate academic programs in the Asia Pacific region. And with our alumni, uh, spread over more than 50 countries all over the world. Most of them occupy prominent positions in the aquaculture industry, in the fisheries industry, uh, in the academia, in the uh, administration, and also in the private industry. Uh, in October 2020, this month, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, is celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, uh, which has a game changer in setting the standards for a sustainable agenda for capture fisheries and aquaculture globally. It's my pleasure to host this webinar, joining this celebration with FAO with a theme of cleaner aquaculture systems. As we know, the land and water as, uh, are, are one of the most limiting factors in aquaculture particularly in the uh, GCC countries uh, in the Middle East region. With these limited resources available, aquaculture need to be intensive to produce more seafood from the scarce resources that are for aquaculture. However, as the aquaculture becomes more intensive, there are also concerns on its sustainable uh, development uh, on its environmental impacts becoming more visible. It's therefore interesting to understand how aquaculture practices have evolved in the GCC countries and the contribution of FAO to the development of these resource efficient and water conserving technologies for aquaculture in the region. We hope that this would be useful for all our participants today. In fact, we have a registered 
a group of participants, more than 400 of them from over 20 countries. Uh, as uh, we go on with the session, we'll have a short break somewhere in the midway of the, uh, of the session. And at that time, we'll be playing a short video highlighting the aquaculture practices in the Middle East. Uh, I would also request all participants to send in their questions if you have by typing in the chat box in your Zoom window. We also greatly appreciate your feedback on the chat box that will help us improve the future webinars that we plan to organize. Uh, again, I would request all participants to keep your microphone muted and also the video switched off uh, all the while because it helps uh, uh, the other participants and also the speaker not to get distracted. And coming to the main agenda, our speaker today is uh, none other than Dr. Lionel Dabadi, uh, who is a senior fisheries and aquaculture officer of the FAO. Dr. Lionel is my good friend and uh, needs no introduction. I know most of you are, uh, you know about him very well. Uh, Dr. Lionel earned his PhD from the University of Paris, Jusieu, France, and has a long professional experience with the Montpellier Supergro, and as a scientist at CIRAD, the French Agriculture Research Center. Lionel has also been a visiting faculty at the Aquaculture Program of AIT for four years since 2011, before he joined the FAO. Uh, today, uh, I'm also glad to note that he had been conferred the title of a distinguished adjunct faculty of AIT in 2015. Lionel has more professional services. He's an associate editor of the Journal of the World Aquaculture Society, and is also very active in social media with his numerous posts that update the aquaculture information for many. Lionel is currently in uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, and he is currently supporting the GCC countries and also Yemen. So without taking much time, I'm inviting Dr. Lionel to begin his presentation. And Lionel, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salin. It is uh, indeed a, a great pleasure to be, to be back in, in AIT. So thank you very much for this, uh, this invitation. I miss this, uh, this unique uh, global village of education that is AIT. I miss the students and I'm very happy to see uh, familiar names here. Uh, I was in AIT at a, at a time where it, it was not always easy with the big fruit that we have, but it was an extraordinary times and uh, I could really appreciate the, the hard work of the AIT students, uh, even when the conditions were very, very difficult and also the, all the, de the dedications of the, of the teachers. So for me today, it's really, uh, it's my first time to, to come back and to teach uh, a, a small lecture at, uh, at AIT and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Anil. So maybe I'm going to start sharing my uh, my screen. I hope you can see it now. Yes, very much. Thank yes. you. So so it, there will be two uh, two, um, two 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 components in my in my presentation. One will be uh, more specifically on the code of conduct for responsible fisheries because uh, next week we are going to celebrate its uh, 25th anniversary. So I thought that it is uh, an opportunity uh, to, uh, to present it a little, uh, a little to the, to the, the audience. I, I, I know that it was part, it used to be part of the curriculum of AIT, so I was looking to, to, to give a, an update as part of this celebration. So um, oh. it was on the 31st, of uh, October of 1995, you know that the, the, the main governing body of FAO as a, as a United, uh, United Nations uh, institution, so the FAO is being governed by the countries, the member countries, and uh, on this 31st of October of 1995, over 170 countries adopted the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. And it was the, the result of, uh, of several years of, of work uh, started in 1982 with the United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea, 
And following uh, following this, you know, it was the time that the Brundtland Commission started to 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 prepare the 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 the, the roots of what would become later the the Rio Declaration, the Agenda 21, and the Sustainable Development. When we started to talk about uh, the Sustainable Development, that was at uh, at this time. Then in 1991, the Committee on Fisheries of FAO recommended to develop the concept of responsible fisheries. At the time, we, the, the word sustainable was not yet uh, yet uh, implemented as it is today. At the time, it was more about responsible fisheries. And through a series of, uh, of uh, steps, intermediate steps, we came out with a, a, a code uh, that has been discussed with all the countries uh, members of, of FAO and uh, which resulted in an agreement being reached on the text of what uh, what should be the code of conduct of for responsible fisheries and what is responsible fisheries so we are this was long time ago 1995 i'm sure that uh, uh, i'm not i'm not sure that all the students uh, attending uh, attending the this lecture today were were born at the time it was uh, it was uh, it was uh, adopted and so why is it May, why is it so important today? Is it still so important? So that, that was a little bit the reason why it is so important is uh, a little bit the, the ones that were given in the in the video uh, broadcast just before the, the, the introduction. Basically, it's what it's because fish is a very important, very important uh, food item. It's uh, very important in terms of proteins, in terms of food security, but it's also very important in terms of nutrition. We know that all over the world we have uh, uh, an epidemic of uh, non-communicable diseases. That is to say, this kind of disease that are more uh, that are not transmitted by pathogens, but are the results of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, bad uh, nutrition, uh, like obesity, etc. And fish can play a major role in this in this area. And as a consequence, the consumption of fish is increasing all the time. Now we are uh, at about 20 kilo, a little bit more than 20.5 kilogram per, uh, per, per per capita and per year. And it was only nine kilograms in 1961. Another reason is that fish is providing a lot of uh, livelihood for millions of people, almost 60 million of people uh, work in the primary uh, sector of fisheries and aquaculture with approximately 40 million in fisheries and 20 million in aquaculture. There is an important component in terms of, uh, of uh, gender, which we must always uh, keep, in, keep, keep in mind. Uh, uh, the, the, the aquaculture area is an area that, that were in which many, many uh, women are involved and their, and their uh, presence is not uh, sufficiently uh, acknowledge that's what some people call it the the invisible uh, sector the of uh, of the of, uh, of invisible component of the of the of the aquaculture sector and the fisheries sectors it is also because of these uh, components major trade items but at the same time when we look at the when we look at the at the production what we can see that uh, that the number of of overfished stocks is increasing uh, all the time. Uh, although today the majority of the production is uh, sustainably managed and uh, and generally most of the main stocks being under fishery management are well managed because fishery management schemes are working, but there are many stocks that are not under uh, fishery management and they are overfished. And another reason also for why the CCRF is important is that uh, the, the, the situation is changing. Uh, in the past and from from ever, the main source of fish has been the the, the the capture fisheries. But today, aquaculture has been increasing dramatically, and today, aquaculture is producing more uh, la, more uh, uh, fish and aquatic animals in terms of weight weight uh, raw raw weight weight than uh, aquaculture than capture fisheries. So this change is also makes that the CCRF is still of uppermost importance uh, today. So what is the code of conduct for responsible fisheries? The code of conduct for responsible fisheries is a collection of principles, goals and elements to support sustainable fisheries, as the names says, 
but also aquaculture. M many times the people don't realize that because it, of the name, which is responsible fisheries, many people don't understand that uh, aquaculture is part of the of the code of conduct, and it's it is an important component of uh, component of uh, of the CCRF. The CCRF is a global consensus, as I told you. It is the countries who have been negotiated the text, have been providing inputs, and have at the end reached the consensus about what is responsible fisheries and aquaculture. It is voluntary. No country is uh, it has to Im to implement it. But if your country uh, is willing to implement responsible fisheries, the, the best way to do it is by following the principles of the of the code. It is uh, available, currently available in 27 languages. I give you the links and I, in fact, you will see I'm providing throughout the presentation, I'm providing you a lot of, of links so you can have an, uh, by, for yourself the, 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 the documents. So it, in 27 languages, that's probably the, the one of the, of the most translated documents published by FAO. And also what is important is that it's not, FAO has not just published the code, but it is monitoring every year its implementation. One year it is moni being monitor monitoring, it is monitoring the capture fisheries, and the other years is, it is monitoring the aquaculture. How does uh, the code of conduct look like? In fact, you have 12 articles. The first articles are more general about the nature and scope of the, of the nature, scope, objective, uh, relationship with other international uh, instruments. Uh, uh, specifications. Then you have some generic requirements about the implementation, the monitoring, the general principles. And then you have uh, a series of uh, sector specific uh, specifications fisheries management, fishing operations, aquaculture development, uh, coastal area management, post harvest practices and trade, and fisheries research. These uh, specific areas. Uh, where the areas that emerged at the time the code of conduct was uh, was uh, was uh, negotiated and discussed, but of course since then the the the, 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 the situation has evolved and as I, I you will see the code of conduct is adapting and evolving to, uh, to 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 be able to cope with the with the new situation. It's not just a, a tool of the past; it's also a tool of the present and a tool of the of the future. So. I give you the, here the 19 principles. I'm not going uh, the, the specific uh, general principles. I'm not going to, into the, the specific ones, and I'm not also going to, to go too much into detail because we don't have the time. But basically, what the the the, the, the tool says it needs says that the countries need to have an effective conservation uh, policy. They need to have fisheries management, and this is very important because uh, fisheries management is something that is uh, that is working. The countries need to pro to work on the overfishing. It, the decisions on, uh, with regards to the responsible fisheries and aquaculture should be based on scientific evidence, it should be based on data, and it should be based on traditional knowledge. There is the principle, the precautionary principle. There is the need for selective and environmental uh, fishing gear and practice. There is also the need to preserve the nutritional value and the quality and the safety of the product throughout the value chain. The need to protect the habitats. The needs to consider the other activities with which uh, fisheries and aquaculture are interacting at, uh, as part of uh, an integrated coastal area management. Uh, there are some uh, provisions with regards to the vessels. So the vessels, the fishing vessels should be monitored and controlled and including uh, there are some provisions for the countries that are, that are delivering uh, their flags uh, to fishing vessels. These countries are responsible for also monitoring the, the, the countries that the, the, the vessels that are flying uh, that are fishing under their flags. The code is encouraging the sub-regional, regional, and global corporations. It is supporting the transparent, participatory, and timely decisions. It also uh, recommends uh, that the principle should be in line with the, the, the obligations um, uh, established by the world trade organizations. When it comes to uh, disputes, uh, it advocates for peaceful handling of the disputes. Of course, the education, the training, the capacity building is very important. There are also social dimensions uh, about providing safe, healthy, and fair working conditions uh, to, the, to, the, to the fishers and to the fish workers, about protecting the rights of the fishers and the fish workers, and in particular, the small-scale uh, fishermen. And finally, the last uh, generic principle is about aquaculture. And uh, which um, uh, which should promote the diversification, which promotes the diversification of income and diets, and as such, 
the resource must be used responsibly and adverse impact on the environment and local community must be mi minimized. And so these are the, the 19 general principle. And then there are some specific ones, which I, I'm not going to, to, to detail. But what I would like to say is the, about these specific ones, of course, the situation is changing. The, the code was, was uh, uh, adopted in 1990 and we are in, in 2018. So you can see that the, 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 the production profile is completely different today as it was in 19, 1995, sorry. Um, at the time, some areas were not considered that important. One area, for example, that is not really uh, considered by the code, although it is mentioned, but not really considered, is the recreational fishing. Uh, at the time, there was no provision, but today we know that it is an area that is very important. So uh, the, 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 the recreational fishing has been, uh, has been uh, considered and, and, new, and technical guidelines have been produced to cope with this specific area as part of the code of conduct uh, for responsible fisheries framework. Also the production, uh, in 1995, aquaculture was representing accounting only for 26% of the global fish production. And in 2018, it's accounting for 54%. So of course, this is also changing. Uh, aquaculture uh, as it is practiced today is not anymore as it was in 1995. New technologies, new innovations, new species, uh, new technologies, bio, new bio, biotechnologies have emerged. And these are creating new uh, challenge for responsible uh, aquaculture positive challenge, but also negative challenge. And that's why uh, the code of conduct is uh, needs to be evolving to continue uh, working, uh, be, be of uh, relevance uh, for the countries in 2018. So the best way for evolving is through the publication of what we call the technical guidelines for responsible fisheries and aquaculture. You will, I give you here a link where you will find uh, all the, these technical guidelines. I just put the cover of some of them. So among the latest one, for example, you have the re 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 recommendation for aquaculture on the responsible use of veterinary uh, uh, medicines and uh, in particular antibiotics. You have the development of aquatic genetic resource. You have aquaculture governance and sector development. These are the, the latest one published uh, by FAO, but you will see that there are, there, there are many, uh, many others. Just, just for aquaculture, you have the list here of the ones that are considering aquaculture. So it's the same. I, I'm providing you this slide so that you can have the link and you can get uh, them uh, directly. In addition to the technical guidelines, FAO is also providing a series of tools. And uh, on the website, you can have a lot of information. For example, you have a lot of information on feeds and fertilizers. You have a lot of information on aquatic genetic resource. You have a lot of information on exotic species. You, of course, you have a lot of publications because you know that FAO, uh, one of the, of the mandate of FAO is to, is to publish uh, technical documentations on, on aquaculture and fisheries. You have the EAA, so the, the EAA is the Ecosystem Approach to Aquaculture and the Ecosystem Approach to Fisheries Toolbox, which is a series of toolbox within the, within the, the tool. You have the FAO Aquaculture Newsletter, you have the FAO Aquaculture Portal, you have the Fishery and Aquaculture Statistics uh, with the yearbook and the, and the statistics themselves. You have the, the GIS, Remote Sensing and, 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 uh, and Mapping of Aquaculture. You have the Legislation of your view, you have the Sector Overviews, you have the Regional Aquaculture Network, the African Water Resource Database, the World Aquaculture Performance Indicators. All these tools uh, are available for free and I encourage you to, uh, to, 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 to make a, a lot of use of them because the, really you, have a, you, you will find a, a lot of information about, uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, aquaculture and how to conduct responsible aquaculture and sustainable aquaculture. So as a, as a, as a conclusion about this introduction on the code of conduct for responsible fisheries, as I said, the code of conduct is an evolving area uh, we, it is considering more and more uh, specific uh, uh, components like recreational, uh, recreational uh, uh, fisheries or the antibiotics, etc. New, through new technical guidelines. So the scope of the code of conduct is expanding, but it's not just about expanding. You know, it's good to produce documents, but if nobody uses uses them, 
it's a problem. So we need to, to, to also have a look at the implementation. And as I said, FAO is uh, conducting uh, annually um, uh, a survey. It's an online survey. So the countries are invited to answer online and to say what is their current state of uh, implementation of the principles of the code of conduct so here i'm giving you the the results of the last uh, of the last uh, survey which was specific on aquaculture in fact it was done uh, last year and it was specific on aquaculture you can find the whole document here in case you're interested and what you can see is that approximately approximately 60 percent of the of the fao members that is to say 60 percent of the of the world countries have answered the survey which is not bad. It's not as we would prefer to have 100% of uh, of, uh, of respondent, but 57 is quite uh, quite good already. And what you can see is that out of these 57, half of the responding members had a relatively high performance. That is to say, they are above the global average for in terms of uh, of implementation of the code of conduct uh, principles. But at the same time, the other half had a lower performance and some sometimes a, a low and very low score, uh, in particular uh, for the aquaculture pro producers that are classified as low income food deficit uh, countries. So today, you know, we, we know that uh, some approaches like fisheries management works when it, it is done up, um, well and doing done well, that means by respecting the principles. Sustainable aquaculture is also a reality but in fact, at the time of implementing, uh, there is a need for providing more support to the implementations on the, of, the, of the principle of the CCRF uh, code, of, uh, code of Conduct. So basically, that's, uh, that's what I, I wanted to say as an introduction about this event. Uh, in case uh, you know in your, uh, in your country of uh, celebrations that may be, that may, may be taking place, uh on the 31st of october to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the of the ccrf do not hesitate to inform me it's always good to to know and to share the the initiatives that are being uh, taking place in the in the world so i will continue uh without a break it's uh, not an now uh, with the presentation on uh, aquaculture uh, in the desert and basically the, the example of the GCC uh, country. So maybe some of you might be wondering what is this acronym, the GCC country. So as I said, I'm working you know, I, as, uh, for the sub-regional office for the GCC states and Yemen. So if you look at the map, this is here the map of the GCC state and Yemen. So basically it is the Arabian Peninsula, which is between, between uh, uh, Africa and, and Asia. So in this uh, part of the country, you have a regional uh, institutions called the Gulf Cooperation Council States. So for all the countries that are bordering the, the Gulf, the sea, uh, the, the Gulf. So this includes Kuwait, this includes uh, Saudi Arabia, this includes Bahrain, this includes uh, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates and Oman. And in addition to the to the to this uh, to these uh, countries, there is also the Yemen, which is not bordering the Gulf, but is part of the peninsula. So these are the the, the whole area uh, about which I'm going to to talk to you uh, today. So basically, I think this picture is the summary of my uh, of my talk: farming fish in the desert. At first, it may look a little bit crazy idea. Uh, we, we, some of you may have seen a few years ago, there was a, a, a romantic movie about farming salmon in the, in, in the Yemen. Uh, and still today, when I'm talking about, uh, talking about uh, farming fish in the desert uh, to my friends or to, 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 to people, they, 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 at first they start laughing. But in fact, yes, it's, uh, you can laugh about farming fish in the desert, but today it's also a reality. It's something, it's a very serious business. And, uh, and that's what I'm, I would like to, uh, to try to, to, to introduce and, and, and present to you. Um, oh. So farming fish in the desert, if you allow me to make a small joke, it's not a mirage. Uh, aquaculture in the desert, uh, the idea emerged in 1963, 1965. 
And already in 2010, FAO organized a, a global uh, technical workshop, and you have the cover of the document, and I, I will provide you the link to download it at the end of the, of the seminar, about aquaculture in deserts and arid lands, development constraints and opportunities. And in the last, uh, last few years, FAO has supported what they call the water scarcity initiatives. It was, the idea was really to, to try to promote uh, different technologies for, uh, for water scarce uh, regions uh, in agriculture, but also in, in aquaculture. And there is a blog also, I will, uh, you will have the, the, the link, uh, where you can, you can read in, uh, in different language, uh, a very nice, uh, a very nice uh, uh, material about aquaponics and integrated agri-aquaculture. Uh, to, 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 to make, for making a, a smart use of, of, uh, of water. So this, uh, this uh, picture shows you the importance of desert areas in the world. You have more than 20 million square kilometers of desert around the world. Uh, if you look for comparison at the size of Russia, Canada, China, and, and USA, which, has, which are the four largest countries in the in, in uh, well, not the, but in, well, the, among the, the largest countries in the world, you can see that uh, that uh, the uh, the surface of desert is bigger than Russia. It's, it's about twice the size. Uh, it's more than twice the size of the of the United States. Uh, just just the Sahara and the the, um, the Arabian Peninsula accounts for more than 11 million. Of square kilometers, so it's it's we are talking about a, a, a very large uh, size of uh, of, uh, of aquaculture, and you have some very famous deserts. So the the blue the the blue uh, squares, the blue box here, are describing case studies that were published, you know, th that were described in this in this book, aquaculture in desert land and and arid land. So it's it's a lot of desert, but if the desert is desert, okay, it's. Uh, it's uh, there is an, a lot of desert, but what's what's the matter? But the problem is that no, sorry. The, the problem is that um, let me go first to this one. The problem is that the desert is not desert. Here I'm giving you the the populations of the of the United uh, the, of the sorry of the GCC and plus CMN countries, and what you can see is that the population is increasing and is increasing very fast. The population here in the in the in the in the regions has almost doubled in, uh, in, in about 20 years. And, and this trend is continuing to increase because you have a lot of economic activities, you have a lot of people who are coming, and everywhere in the world, this is a trend, I'm giving you here the figures for the, for the, for the GCC, but uh, in reality, everywhere in the world, you have the populations in the desert is increasing. And of course, that's, uh, that may be um, uh, a challenge because Deserts, of course, and I think nobody will be surprised, are very hot areas and very dry areas. Here you can see on these two maps. This this map is the map of the temperature uh, during the during the summer the summer time, and you can see that the the Arabian Peninsula is among the warmest areas in the planet. And this is is about the drought uh, and the, and the rainfall, and you can see that the Arabian Peninsula is also among the driest areas of the of the world. So if we have a lot of people living in areas where you have a lot of uh, a lot of, uh, 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 of of water scarcity, uh, how can you feed the people? If you look at this graph, so this graph is proposing you the is giving you the um, the, the, the 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 consumption of fish over over time for the main uh, for the main um, uh, GCC countries so Kuwait Oman Saudi Arabia United Arab Emirates and Yemen and Yemen what you can see that for some countries like Oman and United Arab Emirates the food consumption is not so bad uh, because they are consuming more than the global average yeah, this one is the global average but still the, the the countries are consuming less than other parts of the world. For example, here is the average of the Southeast Asia in 2017. You can see that uh, uh, th these countries are, are consuming far less than this, uh, the, the average Southeast Asia consumption, and of course, far less than some areas like Hong Kong, Iceland, and the Mal Maldives. But for the other countries, uh, like uh, Kuwait, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, or Yemen, the fish consumption is quite, quite, quite limited, and it is, in fact, below 
the recommended uh, consumption uh, for good health that are being made by the World Health Organizations. So there is a challenge to, uh, to, uh, to increase the fish production in this area. And so how can you, how can you increase the production? And how is uh, uh, the, uh, how can you satisfy the demand uh, for fish? So on this graph, you have what we call uh, the food balance sheet uh, for uh, the GCC plus CMN and here for each country uh, individually. The food balance sheet is a very good, uh, very interesting tool, which, which in fact is a balance. So you are considering on the one side the source of fish and on the other side the uses of fish. So what are the sources of fish? The sources of fish are the production, so aquaculture, capture fisheries. You have also the imports of fish. And then, for example, if you have fish storage with frozen fish, you can have the stock variations. And on the other side, what are the uses? You, the uses are the consumption, which is the main, the main use. There is also the exports. There is the non-food use. And also, this is not the case here, but also you can have stock variations in case uh, the countries are being uh, storing uh, fish in the uh, in, in freezing storage, for example. So what you can see is that at the at the level of the region, the capture fisheries is uh, quite important, and the imports also are very important. But if you look at the countries separately, you you see that there are two main categories. You have countries like Oman and Yemen. Oman and Yemen are producing a lot of fish, as you can see here, and they are also uh, consuming a lot uh, of fish, but the, for these two countries, these two countries are, uh, are essentially fish producers, and they are exporting and consuming and exporting their production. But when you look at the other countries, so Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, or the Qatar, you can see that these countries are relatively small producers even very small producers in the UX, as you can see here for Kuwait, etc. But uh, they are importing a lot. They are importing almost 90% of their, of their consumption uh, in these countries. And what you can see also is that the aquaculture, you see the color of, of aquaculture, is still very small in most of the countries, except for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where it is almost not completely but uh, it is it, at least it is uh, significant compared to the capture fisheries uh, production so let's talk a little bit about this uh, production of uh, of of fish in fact we are in the desert but if you look at the map here what you can see is that all the countries have access to the sea. You have no landlocked country in this region, which is not so common. If you look in the in the other parts of the world, you have many landlocked countries which have no access to the sea. So we are in a desert, but we are in a desert with access to the sea. And as a consequence, uh, the, the the populations have a traditional uh, uh, relationship with the sea, which with very ancient cultural values associated to here. Uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, they have access to the Red Sea and they have access to the to the Gulf. In the case of Yemen, they have access to the Red Sea and to the to the, the Arabian Sea. In the case of Oman, they have access to the Arabian Sea and the, the Sea of Oman. And in the case of the other countries, they have access to to the Gulf. And here you can see this is a, a pearl color that is on exhibition at the at the Louvre in Abu Dhabi uh, Museum. Uh, that was made with uh, pearl oysters from the United Arab Emirates, and that was offered by late Sheikh Zayed to the to the famous Egyptian singer uh, Um Kalsum. And uh, uh, and you can see that this this pearl is is a very a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, importance for the for the for the countries. In fact, the people have a lot of respect for the for the fishing and for the ocean and for the fisheries here. I'm give you bring you a quote from Sheikh Hamdan, who belongs to the royal family of the Dubai uh, Emirates. The fishing profession has been inherited from our parents and grandparents. So we must preserve it and we must support its continuity. So really there is a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of interest on protecting the environment, protecting the, protect, protecting the sea. And in fact, one of the, of the big components 
and that that's make, going to be the my last slides before before we make the break has been this pearl oyster fishing in the UAE. Uh, in fact, it's in the UAE, but it's all in all the countries uh, of the Gulf. You know, it's something that is very ancient. There, there are some uh, archaeological evidence that 7,000 years ago uh, there were already some uh, pearl oyster fishing taking place in the Gulf, and it has been. Um, um, uh, a major source of income uh, for the for the countries uh, all the way to the 1920s. You know, the, the, before the today, of course, these countries, most of these countries, they have access to oil resources, so they are relatively uh, wealthy and rich, rich countries. But before oil was discovered, the pearl oyster was the was the the main source of wealth for the country. And uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. More than 1,200 boats carrying about 20,000 people were going for uh, for the annual pearling seasons in the in the United Arab Emirates. You have some some towns that were pearl fishers towns, and today they are ghost town. You can visit them because they are very famous. They they were built at the time where the the the, the, the pearl fishing was uh, was a major activity, and today they have been they have been deserted. And why have they been deserted? It's because in the 1920s, or in fact, in fact, it's uh, earlier, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, this gentleman, Mr. Mikimoto Kokishi-san, uh, has been uh, the inventor of the farmed uh, pearl oysters. And of course, the development of the industry uh, by the end of the 20, 1920s became a major competitor for the for the for the traditional uh, pearl oysters divers. And uh, and it has led to the to the bankruptcy. So I'm going to to make a, a break during uh, for for a few minutes, uh, and uh, and you will see a, 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 a short videos about uh, about the, about this. So maybe I need to I need to uh, remove my sh screen sharing, Dr. Anil. Yeah, thank you, uh, li uh, Dr. Lionel for setting the stage for this presentation with a broad overview of the CCRF and also uh, more valuably giving a, uh, the complete repository of FAO documents that uh, the, the participants can access. And I'll be sharing the presentations with the, part the copy of the presentation with the participants. And uh, uh, during this break, so let us take a break uh, and uh, I will try to share this the the video. So uh, please apologize if the video quality may not be coming good because of network issues or other things. But I, hopefully it works well. So uh, this is about the the pearl uh, fisheries, and uh, here it goes. So in the meantime, please post your questions in the chat box. So we can we can have the Q and A session at the end of the presentation by Dr. Lionel. من بين مختلف أنواع الأحجار الكريمة في العالم. حاز اللؤلؤ على القدر الأكبر من إعجاب الملوك الملكات الأباطرة والمهرجات كان رمزا للقوة وهدية للتعبير عن الحب يكمن جانب من سحر إغراء اللؤلؤ في الغموض الذي يكتنف نشأته وقد بلغت شدة جاذبيته حدا دفع بالعديد من الناس للمخاطرة بحياتهم عبر آلاف السنين لانتزاع هذه الدرة الثمينة من أعماق المحيط لعدة كيلومترات على امتداد سواحل الإمارات وفي أعماق مياه الخليج الدافئة تبدأ دورة حياة المحار بعد انجرافه على شكل يرقات مع التيارات المتدفقة من المحيط حتى تجد مكانا مناسبا لتستقر فيه في أثناء عملية تغذيته يقوم المحار باستيعاب مواد دخيلة وأحيانا حبيبات من الرمل بينما تعلق الأجزاء المرجانية 
أو الأصداف على الغشاء اللحمي الداخلي الحساس مما يؤدي إلى تهيجه عندها يتم عزل العنصر الدخيل في غشاء أو كيس اللؤلؤ الذي يفرز عرق اللؤلؤ وهي نفس المادة الملساء التي يطلق عليه بطبقات محدودة الشفافية من عرق اللؤلؤ حتى تصبح ناعمة الملمس وذات قدرة عالية على الاحتمال تراكم الطبقات عليها مرارا وتكرارا تنتج كل محارة لؤلؤا متجانسا في اللون مع صدفتها أو جدارها المبطن وتتدرج ألوانها ما بين الألوان الفاتحة كالزهري الذهبي والفضي المائل للبياض أو الألوان الداكنة كاللون الرمادي الأخضر والأسود وهذا بالضبط ما كان صيادو اللؤلؤ يبحثون عنه في رحلات الغوص التي استمرت لقرون عديدة في هذه المياه في عصر رواج تجارة اللؤلؤ مع نهاية القرن الماضي كانت تنطلق أعداد كبيرة من قوارب الصيد سنويا في الفترة ما بين شهور يونيو وسبتمبر وحتى فترة الثلاثينيات كان يوجد في إمارة دبي وحدها أسطول مكون من 335 سفينة من أصل الألفي سفينة المنتشرة في مياه الخليج وعلى متن هذا الأسطول كان يعمل ما يقرب من 80 ألف بحار ينتمي حوالي 22 ألفا منهم إلى ما كان يسمى بالإمارات المتصالحة وكان كل هؤلاء يعتمدون على تجارة اللؤلؤ كمصدر للرزق في أثناء الاستعداد للرحلة كان يتم دهن أجزاء السفن بكل من الزيت والشحم بغرض الحماية من المياه المالحة ومن ثم تحميلها بالماء والغذاء والحبال وغيرها من الاحتياجات الضرورية كانت هذه مهمة جماعية يشارك فيها كل الأفراد وعند إعلان النخذة أو ربان السفينة لبداية الرحلة يتقدم كل من عقد العزم على الغوص فيتم إعطاؤهم دفعة مقدمة من مستحقاتهم حتى يتمكنوا من شراء الأغذية اللازمة لعائلاتهم التي سيتركون وراءهم طال عمرك هذا طال عمرك أنه خذى يوم يمد الغوص يقوضهم قواض قواض يعطيهم 300 ويعطيهم عيش حق البيت يونية عيش يحسبها عليهم أول يونية تقريبا حوالي بخمسة ريال أو بعشرة ريال يعني حسب ربيات ربيات هندية في أحيان كثيرة كان الغواصون يخرجون في هذه الرحلات ليتمكنوا من سداد الديون المستحقة عليهم والناتجة عن إنفاقهم على عائلاتهم لتوفير كافة متطلباتهم خلال فترة غياب السفن في البحر لمدة قد تصل إلى أربعة أشهر وعندما يحين يوم الرحيل تخرج كل العائلات من القرية لوداع الغواصين وفي مشهد مثير للحماسة ترتفع أصوات البحارة والغواصين بغناء المواويل المصحوبة بقرع الطبول والتي تتردد أصداؤها لعدة أميال أربعة الشهر حوالي في البحمل حوالي 120 نفر في 100 نفر يعني على حسب الغارب فحد يسوب السوا... السيف فوق الغيص تحت الغاصة يغوصون والسيوب يسوبون وحد منهم قسم يفلج يفلج محار ال... الغاصة يغوصون حد فصلة حد فصلتين حد ثلاث فيعني هذا على طول الأربع شهور هالنمونة يعني ساعة الغوصون غيص غيص يعني توقف من الصبح إلى المغرب السيب واقف والغيص في البحر أي قصرون بيقصرون بيغيرون مكان من منطقة إلى منطقة بيقصرون وبيرون يعني هذه حياتهم ثانيا المعاملة كانهم أخوة في محمد واحد كلهم واحد يعني 120 ما تقول واحد السيب يسوب والغيص يغوص واللي يفلد يفلد وهذا ترى ما في ما عندهم شيء اختلافات يعني وعمرهم عند واحد وعمرهم عند واحد عند النوخذ اي العمر عند النوخذ يعمل الغواصون بشكل مترادف مع السيوب الذين تقع على عاتقهم مسؤوليه رفع السلال المملوءه بالمحار ومن ثم الغواصين انفسهم في اثناء تواجده في الماء 
يتمكن الغواص من جمع ما يقرب من دزينة من الأصداف عندها يقوم بحل الحبل الملتف حول عنقه ويجذبه بقوة لمرتين متتاليتين بانتظار أن يرفعه السيب بأسرع وقت ممكن إلى سطح الماء مع تواجد هذا العدد الكبير من الناس على متن قارب واحد لعدة أسابيع في كل رحلة من رحلات الصيد كان من السهل معرفة السبب وراء التماسك المتين الذي يتمتع به مجتمع الصيادين وقت النوم كله المبكر المبني على التجارة البينية بكافة أنواعها مع كل المجتمعات الخليجية الأخرى والهند وفارس ودول شرق أفريقيا مع نهاية القرن الماضي كانت عائدات تجارة اللؤلؤ تقدر بحوالي سبعة ملايين دولار أمريكي بنسبة تصل إلى خمسة وتسعين بالمئة من الدخل القومي كانت ثروة الإمارات المبدئية تعتمد على نتيجة مواسم الصيد فإذا كان الموسم موفقا فإن الأموال التي يجنيها كل من الغواصين ومالكي القوارب وتجار اللؤلؤ سيتم تداولها في الأسواق مما يعود بالنفع على جميع أفراد المجتمع ومع ازدهار منطقة الخليج كانت تجارة اللؤلؤ تعتبر دوما المحور الرئيسي لجميع الأنشطة الاقتصادية وهكذا استمر الحال وحتى إشراقة فجر عصر النفط كان السبب الرئيسي وراء توقف نشاط صيد اللؤلؤ في منطقة الخليج العربي عائدا إلى تطور تقنية زراعته صناعيا في اليابان والتي أغرقت الأسواق بما يسمى باللؤلؤ الصناعي مما أدى إلى انخفاض أسعار اللؤلؤ في الأسواق العالمية وهو ما دفع المشترين في العاصمة البريطانية لندن إلى تفضيل اللؤلؤ الصناعي الذي اعتبر حينها الأكثر ملاءمة ومع التغيرات الدراماتيكية المفاجئة في اقتصاديات الإقليم والتي نجمت عن الثورة النفطية أصبح صيد اللؤلؤ يتحول تدريجيا إلى مجرد رمز لحقبة من الزمان قد ولت إن مجموعة اللآلئ الطبيعية التي أنتم بصدد مشاهدتها تعد إحدى أثمن المجموعات الفريدة المتوفرة في العالم كما أنها تعكس لنا صورة من روائع الكرم للمرحوم سلطان العويس والذي خلف لنا مجموعته الشخصية تحت رعاية بنك دبي الوطني لتوثيق عصر اللؤلؤ في ذاكرة الأجيال القادمة من أبناء الإمارات والعالم أجمع إن صيد اللؤلؤ من أعماق البحر كان أكثر من مجرد وسيلة لكسب لقمة العيش كما لم يكن أيضا عملية صناعية بحتة لقد كان تقليدا أسلوب حياة اتبعه المرحوم سلطان العويس ووالده والعديد ممن عاشوا على مدى القرون الماضية إنه لم يكن بالأسلوب الذي يعتمد على مبدأ الإثراء السريع المنتشر في عصر النفط ولكنه يعتمد على العلاقة المستمرة بين قرى الصيد المنتشرة على السواحل ومياه الخليج المعانقة للصحراء وهي ذات العلاقة القائمة بين الغواص والبحر ينتهي الغوص الله الحمد لله رب العالمين يقول الله اذا سديت باب العبد فتحت له باب سد باب الغوص فتح لنا باب البترول الكويت السعوديه البحرين قطر الامارات امان الايران كلهم هي يغوصون بدا اليوم بند باب الغوص ربي فتح لهم البترول قال فتح باب خزائن الارض اللي وعدها الله زين video nice and uh, fisheries and aquaculture is a tradition of its own in in the gcc countries so 
Dr. Lionel, please continue your presentation and then uh, we have one more video uh, to, in, in the next break. Dr. Lionel, please. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Salim. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you, as you can see, uh, the, 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 the link with the ocean is, is, uh, is uh, very important uh, for, 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 the, for the people uh, in, the, in the Arabian Peninsula. But when you look at the importance of the, of the oceans, you can see that the, most, the, 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 the largest coastline is not on the Gulf, it's, it's in fact on the Red Sea, in the, in the, in the Red Sea, the, the, Arab, uh, the Arabian, Arabian Sea or the Oman Sea. But not all the countries. Only Oman, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen have a coast along this uh, this uh, this country. So that's why these countries are the main fisheries producers. But when you look at, at the Gulf, uh, you can see that the majority of the countries, in fact, uh, have a have a have a coast uh, in the Gulf. And for most of them, uh, 196 to 100 percent is on the on the Gulf. So that's why the Gulf is so important. For, for all uh, for all the countries. So this is reflected in the in the productions. What you can see here, you have the the the, the, the capture fisheries in the in the in the in the Gulf, which are relatively stable, uh, not uh, not uh, changing uh, a lot. But the, the most of the production comes from the from the the the, uh, the other sea than than the Gulf. In the case of the Gulf. Although it is very important culturally and uh, for, for, for all the countries, the production on fisheries from this area do not increase. And one of the reasons is that there are some, some fears about over-exploitation of, uh, of, of various species. And uh, one of these uh, emblematic species is the kingfish, uh, the Scombero morus commerson. And this year, we had an as historic achievement because for the very first time the RECOFI, the RECOFI is the Regional Commission for Fisheries which includes not only the Gulf Cooperation country but also the countries that are bordering the other side of the coast that is to say Iraq and Iran and all the countries of the bordering, bordering the Gulf have uh, started to implement a, 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 a fishing ban uh, from the 15th of August to the 15th of uh, October, so it was a few days, uh, only a few days, and it is a major achievement, you know, because when it comes to a to a shared resource like the like the stocks of this uh, of this kingfish that is shared by so many countries, it is very important to have a cooperation uh, at the at the regional level, and this is one of the major achievement that they have. But still, many species are being uh, are being endangered, and and for for many countries, the way to continue uh, consuming those species is by developing aquaculture of these species. In fact, uh, you remember some countries they have a low production, low production, so they want to develop aquaculture to increase the fish production, generally speaking. But for some countries, other countries like the United Arab Emirates uh, uh, and well, in fact many countries, the objective is not just to increase the consumption of fish, but also to sustain the consumption of of those species that the people are accustomed to eat. And so today, most of the countries are willing uh, to develop their aquaculture. Aquaculture is very high on the agenda of the development in, uh, in, uh, in these countries. I will provide you the links uh, at the end of my presentation of these three documents. This document was was developed by the, the Ministry for, for Food and Water Security of the United Arab Emirates. This document was uh, developed by the Ministry of Agriculture and Fishery Wealth of Oman. This document was developed by the Ministry uh, of Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia together with uh, FAO. Uh, these are all strategic and investment on developing aquaculture. And I'm sure that in the countries, I, I, I'm giving you these three documents because I, I, I know them, but you have in all the countries, in all the GCC countries, you have a high priority for developing aquaculture. How do you develop aquaculture? I, I don't have much time to, to express, but I, when I was teaching at AIT, that was one of my uh, one of the of the of the course that I, I was responsible for about uh, aquaculture planning and, and management. So in just in just a couple of slides, uh, you have the situation is not the same 
depending on older countries. And, and very, very sharply, uh, you can have uh, three kinds of main situation. You have what we call the new entrants. These are the countries that would like to develop aquaculture, but they don't know exactly, or they have tried, but they have not been successful. So that we call the new entrants. Then you have the emerging aquaculture country. For, so for the new entrants, the idea is what kind of technologies should we use? What kind of model for aquaculture development should we use to become an aquaculture producers? Then you have those countries that have already developed with some success aquaculture, but the aquaculture is still relatively small. And so the, the main challenge is to upscale the production. That's what I call the emerging aquaculture countries. And then you have the advanced aquaculture countries. These countries where aquaculture is already highly developed, but because of food security or because of, uh, because of, uh, of uh, economics, it would be important to continue increase it in a sustainable way. And so the main question is how we can, we can do that. So you can see the, the questions are very different depending on the, on, on the countries. In the case of the, of the GCC countries, I would say we, don't, we are not really yet in this kind of situation of advanced aquaculture countries. We are rather at the level of the new entrants, so countries who are trying to, to think and figure out how they can develop aquaculture, or the emerging aquaculture countries, like the, I would say that the, the, the Saudi Arabia, for example, has been quite successful so far, and uh, what they, they want is to continue upscale it uh, in, in the future. So one, one element that we speak a lot generally is the enabling environment. I don't have time, but the enabling environment is to create the conditions so that aquaculture will, will develop. Of course, it is very important to have all these elements that I'm listing here, about production, finance, the science, research, extension, capacity building, education, law, government, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality shows that some countries, they don't have all those elements in place, but still they can, uh, they can, uh, they have a successful aquaculture. And at the same time, you have also some examples where countries are investing a lot to, uh, to try to create an enabling environment, but aquaculture is not developing a lot. So that's why I'm, I prefer to, to speak about operationalizing an enabling environment. The purpose is not necessarily to have the whole enabling environment for aquaculture, but to have it sufficiently so that it is operational and it, it supports aquaculture development. And for this, I would like to give two quotes of, uh, of, uh, from Elinor Ostrom. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's something very, you know, development is something very complicated, very complex, because you have so many people, so many stakeholders at different levels, from the government to the farmers, uh, so many technologies, so many species, etc. It's, it's very complex. But what she said, so Elinor Ostrom was the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize in, of, in Economy because of her work on development and complexity, uh, complexity, complexity. And so what she was saying, first of all, we need to explain the world of interactions and outcomes occurring at multiple level. We also have to be willing to deal with complexity instead of rejecting it. That is to say, we, we should not make a simplistic, you know, uh, uh, the simplistic solutions seldom work. Because, you, you, because the world is not simple, the, work is, the world is, is complex. And the second thing, uh, which is a warning that uh, she says, uh, she explains that um, um, we call attention to the perverse and extensive use of policy panaceas in misguided efforts to make socio-ecological systems sustainable over time. It is not enough, however, just to call attention to the inadequacy of the panaceas that are prescribed as simple solution to complex socio-ecological systems. Unfortunately, the preference for simple solutions to complex governance problems continues to be strong. And that's what we, we would like to avoid here in the, in the UAE. We don't want to, to have a, a too narrow or a too simple visions of aquaculture in the, in the country. And we want to provide simple solution to a complex challenge, which is aquaculture development, sustainable aquaculture development. I have seen some questions arising uh, in the chat, which I, I will answer later, but I think that's really this, this situation. I think there is no, many times there is no simple solution uh, to a given problem. We, the, the, the situation must be, must be uh, different. And this is the, probably the last, uh, last slide I, I'm going to show you, which is the one I, I was showing to, to my students at, at the time is that, Many times when we, we talk about aquaculture development, we see a, a linear process. We, for example, 
uh, we make research and then the research is, is translated into uh, into uh, demonstration units and then you have the early adopters and you have then you have the development taking place we we give a linear vision but in reality aquaculture development is not a linear vision and here I'm using a, a graph from Bruno Latour, which is a, a famous uh, sociologist of innovation, who is explaining that, in fact, the development, when we make development, in fact, we are always at a time with things that are supporting us or that are enabling us, what he calls the supporter program. So the things that are supporting us, it can be either the, the government is supporting us or it can be uh, the research is producing new knowledge that is supporting our work or uh, the, we have a new species that uh, that is supporting us that is an, that these are the enablers so these are the things that for, with which we can develop aquaculture but on the on the other side we have also what he calls the opponent and the anti program the people who are against the people the, the things that are against us so the things can be people it can be uh, uh, opponents uh, for x or, or y reasons but it can be also uh, a technology that doesn't work or it can be an environment for example in the case of the of the of the gcc countries it's clearly that the environment and the water scarcity for some times has been an opponent to aquaculture development it has been a disabling factor for aquaculture development and how can we develop it there are two ways for 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 uh, for uh, for uh, being successful the first thing is to remove the disabling factor but for example in the gcc we cannot remove the water scarcity unless we we are capable to make the rainfall in quantity sufficient we will not be able so the only way to to avoid this would be to shift you know to shift the way we approach and to find an alternative solution and in fact uh, so in the case of uh, of the gcc for example it will be by adopting new technologies that allows to produce fish within the conditions that we have and in fact a successful development process is when you have the people who are responsible for the development they can they know exactly what are their their enablers they also know exactly what are the disabling factors and they can manage to use the the, the enabling factors to make development happen and by avoiding the disabling factor so the road in fact you see the, the 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 road of development is not a linear road it's a it's a curving uh curving uh, road so these are a little bit theoretical but i wanted to to show you how is uh, we are approaching this uh, this issue uh in, in in the gcc let's go back to the to the gcc i saw some questions about the species etc this is the aquaculture the aquaculture production in the gcc and in fact, I give you two figures. The, the two figures is the same. The only difference is that here in these figures, I have removed Saudi Arabia. So you can see immediately the importance of aquaculture in Saudi Arabia, which accounts for the for the 90, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia alone accounts for 94.7 percent of the total production of the region. Uh, so we, the, the current production of uh, Saudi Arabia is approximately 72,000 tons. And just like uh, we have the main species that we have uh, in the regions, in fact, you can see that there is a lot of interest. I told you that the, the, the people are interested in, in, in developing the species and, you, uh, and, and, and they, they, they have been testing many different species. Altogether, for FAO between 1950 and 2018, 39 species have been reported as being found. And we know that this 39 is a, an underestimation because there are some species that we know have been are, are found or have been found and that are not listed in this table. So for the 39, it's 23 marine fish, 10 freshwater fin fish, four shrimp, one oyster, and in fact it's not the it's not the pearl oyster, although there are there is some research now, but it's the Crassostria gigas, uh, and uh, one sea cucumber. So it's the same. If I present the, 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 the main species, I have the, 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 the species with Saudi Arabia and by excluding Saudi Arabia. If I include Saudi Arabia, you can see that the white leg uh, shrimp is the, main, uh, is the main species farmed in terms of uh, production volume, followed by the tilapia, the Asian sea bass, and the sea bream, the gilthead sea bream, the European sea bream. But if I exclude, uh, uh, I exclude uh saudi arabia then you have a quite a different picture with the main species becoming the gilt sea bream which is more than half of the of the total production 
uh, followed by the the European uh, the European sea bass, the Indian white prone, sorry, the Nile tilapia, the Indian white prone, and uh, and then you have a, a series of other species, including the orange potter grouper, which uh, which is a very symbolic species here in the in the regions. It's called the hamor. So let's review a little bit the different technologies uh, in the in the in the region. Freshwater aquaculture. Let's start by freshwater. Freshwater, of course, as I told you, it's uh, it's scarce. It's we are in a desert, so there is no freshwater. Wait, there is a little freshwater, and in fact, because it is scarce, the people they 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 you know they have a a, a multi uh, millionaire expertise with managing this this uh, this water they have the system this system is called the afflage i cannot show you because it would take too much time but the, the history of afflage is is very 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 interesting to, to to look and if you search on the on the internet on on youtube you will find the movies showing you this technology that can be two thousand three thousand four thousand years old uh, about managing managing the the irrigation uh, managing the captation of water and the irrigation of the of the of the systems and as a result you can make aquaculture of course you are not going to make it's not uh, it's not uh, like in southeast asia where water is is abundant but still you can make aquaculture here i give you a picture you have a uh, 50000 uh, tilapia in this in this lake uh, the, in fact, this lake, I'm, uh, it's not really the main production area. It's more the, it's a lake, it's an artificial lake that is created by using the, the, the waste water from a fish farm uh, in tanks. But still, you can see you have, you have a pond, you have ponds, uh, stocked pond in the, in the desert. However, of course, the main, the main, uh, the main uh, way of producing uh, freshwater aquaculture in the desert is through uh, integrated aquaculture or recirculated aquaculture. I'm providing you two books, and I, it's the same. I'm, I will be giving you the, the, the links uh, later uh, that describe the different initiatives. For example, one, one is the aquaponic experiment that uh, Dr. Gagliardo who used to be uh, at, at, at uh, AIT at the time I was there, is conducting at the Sultan Qaboos uh, universities on, on aquaponics. You have also a uh, possibility to consider integrated irrigation aquaculture. For example, with the, with the threat of, the, of climate change, uh, many countries are investing in building uh, water storage. So you could consider to have some, some cages, for example, in this uh, water storage. I give you here the example of a farm. In fact, this farm is the one which has the, the lake, the ponds that I showed you a couple of minutes. The pond, in fact, is not, cannot be seen here, but it is just uh, at the bottom of the, of the picture. And in fact, it's an integrated agriculture aquaculture farm. So what do you have? You have first of all, you have a tilapia hatchery here, which uh, you can see here. They are using uh, the AIT, uh, AIT practice with the production in, in HAPA. The only thing that they are not doing, because it's prohibited in the, in the United Arab Emirates, is that they are not uh, sex reversing the the, the fry, uh, they are producing mixed, uh, mixed sex uh, tilapia. Then you have the fish going out in two units, one unit here and one another unit here. And then the water, the used water from the, from the, from the farm is going to the, an azola and duckweed uh, tank. And this azola and duckweed is used for contributing to the feeding of animal. Uh, so you, they have chickens for eggs. And they have chicken for meat and goats also in the in the in the in this uh, in in this section. Then the water from the azola goes to an irrigated crop uh, level. You can see here the way the uh, you have the irrigation, and this I call it the upper level because you have another section which is at a lower level. So the water from this uh, from this uh, system goes to the to the other level. And for example, they are farming. They are, the the crop is uh, they are using alfalfa for feeding also the animals. So for, uh, uh, yes, as animal feeds. And finally, they, they have the, the, the next step is a forestry and the forestry is planted to avoid, uh, to, to, to protect the, the farm from the dunes, from the sand dunes, because the sand dunes are just outside of the farm and, and the water that, uh, that has been, uh, not been used for the forestry goes into the, into the pond. And so like this, you have the, the person is really making an integrated production and, and, and protecting the farm at the same time. And this is uh, quite a, an interesting approach. Uh, and they is, uh, is, uh, this, uh, this farmer is providing a lot of, uh, of uh, training to, to other farmers. Uh, 
this is not only uh, fr integrated pharma. Uh, here I have an example that which I took from the from the from the book, uh, FAO, uh, which was published a few a few weeks ago about the economic analysis of an integrated uh, tilapia uh, farm in Oman. I think I don't have so much time to go into detail, but what you can see uh, is that um, based on the so these are the hypotheses. So you can see the the farm. Uh, produced uh, 36,000 tons, uh, in fact, with 10 cycles of uh, 3.6 uh, tons, 10 hours per year, and 120,000 fingerlings of one gram, and the market size being around 300 grams average body weight in 260 days. And uh, the, the economic analysis here for the investment, the investment is approximately $100,000 uh, the, 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 the cost, the viable cost for the fingerlings, the feeds, the labor, the electricity and other costs is approximately 66,000 USD. And the revenue uh, by selling uh, the, the fish at approximately 2.3 uh, USD per kg is 84,000, making a net income of $18,000. So that makes a payback period for this farm of approximately five years. Another technology that has a lot of success in the region is the aquaponic farm. So this farm, in fact, is a semi-public farm. It's a, in fact, it's the Zayed Agricultural Center for Development and Rehabilitations. It's a, it's a system that provides, uh, you know, uh, in, in the United Arab Emirates, the, 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 the disabled people are, can receive a, uh, you know, um, a, a revenue uh, for their livelihoods, but they are, they are provided also with op job opportunity. And this is a, a, this farm, this aquaponic farm, which is very close to uh, Abu Dhabi city, is uh, one of the of the activities. And they have um, um, uh, an aquaponic unit. And the aquaponic unit in the in the UAE are a little bit on the same model. They have four growing out tanks. And then you have a, a filtration system with a physical filter, uh, um, um, uh, a biofilter, and then the collections to go to the hydroponic plants. Here, in this case, it's tomato, tomato uh, on floating floating raft. Another farm, which this time is is uh, is uh, is commercial and is producing uh, is producing. Um, uh, 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 um, Oh, I have it up. Uh, one, uh, one ton per month uh, of fish. Uh, it's the Emirates International Agricultural Advanced Company. It's the same system, so four tanks, uh, but they have uh, eight independent units of the four of the four tanks, with four fish tanks and one filtration unit. They have also hatchery with mixed, mixed sex tilapia, and they have hydroponic crops. But at the time I made the visit, the crops were not uh, in in production. So just uh, some technical, some technical uh, information about uh, this information, this uh, kind of uh, farms. The commercial size in uh, in the UAE seems to be bigger than in Oman. So because it's between half half a kilogram and uh, 800 grams average body weight, the final stocking density is between 25 and 50 kilograms per cubic meter. The production cost is between 1.7 and 1.9 uh, dollar per kg, knowing that the feed accounts for one dollar out uh, of the total and uh, the food conversion ratio is between 1.5 and 1.8. The farm gate price uh, which is uh, quite good because it's generally uh, direct sales uh, for boost uh, for the boost units is 3 to 3.5 uh, dollar per kg. Uh, what I said at the beginning is that of course we are in the desert so in the desert it's hot and 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 how can you produce uh, crops and fish when the temperature can reach uh, 50 50 degree during the summer time in fact there, there is a very very efficient uh, technology called the evaporative cooling system so what you can see is that on one side of the greenhouse you have this kind of pad that is uh, wet uh, permanently keep it kept well and on the other side you have big fans big ventilators uh, creating a, an air movement. And the way it works, in fact, is that because of the water, you know that evaporating, evaporating one gram of, uh, of water requires a, a lot of energy. And so by, by using this system, you can cool the temperature by a lot, in fact. And the, when the, the driest, the air, uh, and in the desert generally, it's very dry, 
the coolest you can expect. For example, if you have a, in this graph, uh, uh, in this system, if you have a temperature of uh, 32 degrees outside, and by using the system, you can get uh, a 10 degree, more than 10 degree uh, decrease uh, of the temperature when the air is, is only at 30% of, uh, of humidity. So this is a system that works very well, uh, and that is a great technology, and that makes the the the, the possibility of the of the of having uh, uh, hydro uh, aquaponic farms in the desert under the green greenhouses. Uh, another example I wanted to 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 highlight from Bahrain. You you may know Bahrain is a small island uh, state. Uh, so they don't have much opportunity. They don't have a lot of, of water. Uh, I mean, fresh water because of the size of the island. It's quite uh, uh, fresh water is quite quite difficult. Of course, they have marine water, but still, uh, there is an interesting farm called the United Aquaculture uh, Company, the fish farm Bahrain, and they have been developing their aquaculture production with aqua tourism. So as you can see, they have tanks. And the, the people, the families, they can come and they can fish by themselves the, their, their, uh, their tilapia. And this is, a, I think that, you know, the aqua tourism has proven to be a major driver for aquaculture development in many parts of the world. So I think it's quite interesting also to have this in the, in the, in, in the GCC, in the GCC countries. Uh, another, um, another area uh, is that uh, another, characteristic of the desert is that when we say that water is scarce it's not so much true in fact you have a lot of water in the ground floor in the in the deserts but this water is salinized it's saline it's saline water and it can be it can be between brackish uh, water to very saline you know 60 60 ppt etc so uh, depending on the section so uh, we also uh, considered the possibility, in addition to, the, to making tilapia, for example, in, in fresh water, we have been making some studies for considering the possibility of farming marine species inland. And uh, we have made a, a report. In fact, uh, it's, a, it's a report that was made by, by another person from AIT. AIT is everywhere. Um, it's uh, Dr. Pantanella, Eduardo Pantanella, made this uh, this uh, survey for uh, for FAO a few a few years ago about the potential for development of aquaculture in sal salinized agriculture farm, and he has been able to propose a few technologies that could be uh, could be done. By, so, for example, with, for the gilded sea bream or the Asian sea bass in indoor intensive recirculation system, or shrimp productions in an indoor bioflock system, or also standalone aquaponics and hydroponic system. Um, let's shift to marine aquaculture uh, now. As I said, uh, the, because of the conditions, uh, we need to have recirc recirculated uh, aquaculture. And of course, the bulk of the production today uh, in the United Arab Emirates is, uh, is, the, uh, is the RAS technology. It comes from the RAS technology. And you may have heard that we have salmon. In fact, salmon here, this is this farm is producing salmon uh, uh, in the desert. This farm is also producing, is really in the desert. This one is Emirate Fish, Fish Farm, is producing grouper in the desert. And it's, they are really in the desert, in fact. If you get out of, the, out of the farm, out of the building, you can see the sand dunes, and it's, uh, it's really the desert. And here you have Dr. Gopak, uh, Gopak Omar, who has been working with, uh, with AIT also, and he, he has uh, several uh, very interesting uh, recirculated aquaculture systems in the, in, the, in the United Arab Emirates and promoting this system. So for the, for the students, uh, you, you, I presume you know the principles of a recirculated aquaculture systems, but basically you have an intensive production of fish in tanks. And uh, of course, to be able to, uh, to recirculate the water, uh, you need to make a treatment. So you, the treatment first is a mechanical filter. Generally, it's a drum, drum filter to remove the particles. Then you have a, a biofilter. Uh, the biofilter is for converting the toxic ammonia into nitrate, which is less toxic. Then you have the degazer to avoid uh, to avoid having uh, having uh, issues of uh, over um, uh, over saturation in, in gas. You have an oxygen enrichment system. Uh, you possibly a UV disinfection, and then you recirculate you recirculate the system. So this system that we have in the in the United Arab Emirates 
are working very well. As I told you, we can commercially produce uh, 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 species like salmon. They, 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 they are also in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, a caviar uh, sturgeon farm using recirculated aquaculture system. So we, we can produce basically any kind of fish we want uh, in, in, in the desert today. The main uh, constraint faced is the cost of the cooling and of the chilling is the availability of feed because there, I will talk uh, more later but feed is not that much available in the in the um, in the in the region today and it's always a problem uh, the, the the as long as aquaculture production is not developing the the big uh, the big uh, feed manufacturers they don't want to invest but if they don't invest aquaculture does not develop so that's part of the complexity that I mentioned at the at the beginning uh, there is also some issue with regard to equipment maintenance uh, with regard to the commercial scales, the commercial scales today is about uh, a few hundreds of tons uh, per year. And whereas you know that the big, uh, the big uh, commercial uh, recirculated aquaculture systems in uh, in other parts of the world can be a few thousands. Even uh, I think the biggest one are around ten thousand tons of fish uh, annually. So the the units are still relatively small. And as as a consequence of being small, there is the possibility for economies of scales are limited. There are some issues with regards to the markets because there is a lot of imports in the country and then the country, the, the locally produced fish must uh, compete with imported, imported products. And sometimes uh, because, uh, uh, as I told you, the, 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 the people, they, they really want to farm uh, local species. Here you have the, the, the hamur, uh, the, 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 the grouper. Uh, so there might be some specific challenge because these species are not necessarily completely domesticated and so there is some there is some uh, some work with this so this is for the recirculated aquaculture for the marine aquaculture inland then we have the marine aquaculture in the desert so this these pictures are taken from uh, from Oman but the, the part of Oman I don't know if you know uh, the geography of the region but Oman has one part which is in fact in the north of the United Arab Emirates it's a, it's an enclave uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the north and in this part is very favorable for the fin fish cage aquaculture in Musanda and they have a big big ambitions really Oman is investing is currently investing a lot in developing its uh, its aquaculture and uh, and there are very interesting uh, interesting uh, uh, initiatives in the in this region you have uh, very few oysters uh, yesterday I had a discussion with Dr. Salin about IMTA, but in fact there is no IMTA yet in the region. And one of the reasons is that there is a very limited uh, marine uh, oyster production. And as far as I know, there is no seaweed production. But one, at least in the United Arab Emirates, you have one, uh, one in Diba, Diba oysters in Fujairah, the Diba oysters um, uh, aquaculture. So for FAO, what we are doing, we are trying to identify now, right now the, the most suitable technologies because the main difficulty that we have in the Gulf is that it's a shallow water, shallow sea. So we, it's not very, it's, it's a shallow sea, it's a very hot sea. It's a very saline water, particularly during the summer. So we need to, we need to, 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 to consider this, what we can do in this, um, in this context. So what you can do for identifying the suitable technologies, here it's a decision-making uh, graph. So you need to first to make uh, some kind of spatial planning based on the bathymetry, the distance from shore, because if the farm is too far, it, does, it will not make sense to develop aquaculture. With the stakeholder conflicts, you know, potentially in the region, in the Gulf, we, ha we can have a, a lot, you know, with the oil platforms, with the fishermen, with the, with the, 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 the commercial vessels which have their route, etc. We cannot do, uh, we, we have a lot of potential uh, areas that we, we must uh, avoid. And also uh, the environments, the protected areas because of the coral reef, uh, because of the other farms, the pollutions, etc., etc. So all these areas. So using these four components, we can make a special planning and identify the different areas uh, that uh, are possible in the, for making uh, aquaculture. But then it's not enough to say in this area you can make aquaculture. We need to identify some specific sites where you can make aquaculture. And here we need some more information. So we need to have information about the current speed and directions, about the winds, speed and directions, about the waves, the height and the directions, and about the water quality. And then based on when you have this criteria, then you can select, okay, in this area, we can develop aquaculture. And once you have this, 
you need to find the technologies and the technologies uh, will, will include different components. It will include the energy, the current, the wind and the waves. In fact, you, you, you can have more exposed or less exposed uh, uh, areas. That's what we call the low energy, for example, for the, for the, for the, for the sites that are uh, protected, uh, sheltered. Uh, that's a low energy and you don't need to have uh, the technologies are relatively simple but in other areas with high energy site then you will need to have very strong equipment very strong technologies and uh, and, and systems and then you 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 need to select the, the species you need to determine the carrying capacity you need also you must never forget also that uh, when we talk about marine aquaculture you need infrastructures inland uh, for the jetty for the cleaning of the nets, for the for the 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 the, 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 yes, the maintenance of the nets, maintenance of equipment, etc. So that's also one component. And based on this, you can define the cage technologies, the design of the farm, and the aquaculture equipment. So to give you some example, this work has been done in Saudi Arabia. I get you here. You have the publications. You you know all along the coast of the of the Red Sea. At least you have maps. And these are the criteria that the that the the, the, the uh, that has been followed uh, for the document. This work has also done been done in um, in by Oman by the government of Oman. You can download the, the 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 publication here. And it was not restricted to the marine aquaculture. In fact, they have also considered uh, the inland aquaculture. So abalone restocking program, sea cucumber restocking program, the semi semi intensive or intensive shrimp farming the land-based seawater fish farming, the land-based freshwater fish farming, and the sea cage farming. And you can see here, that's what, that's the, the, the Musam Dam, the area I was mentioning. This one is, uh, this area is uh, is United Arab Emirates, but here it's Musam Dam, and that's where uh, aquaculture uh, in cages can be can be developed. And they have also been using a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, criteria for defining this. When it comes to the Gulf, that's the work we have been, uh, we are currently doing. That's uh, our colleagues Martin Van Brakel, Patrick White, and Alessandro Ciataglia. And so, what we have been defining is the the different kind of uh, technology. So, for example, for the deepest areas, uh, these areas uh, are uh, suitable for uh, submersible cages. You know, these kind of cages that uh, because these areas are, are deep enough, but they are also high energy they, they, the, the waves are big you have big waves you have big storms uh, you have big very strong currents uh, so you need to have this kind of technology the, the submersible technologies here and you can see you have also to consider the the distance from the shore because uh, if you are in a very far area the transport if it takes uh, eight hours just to go feeding the, the cage it will not be profitable so you, you need to find areas that are very close to the to the coast to to identify the 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 the, 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 the sites. So this is for the for the submersible cages. This area is in fact is for the with a depth range of approximately twenty to forty cages, which is uh, um, covering a a, a, a a larger area. And for the shallowest part, you see the shallow the shallow areas in the Gulf. Uh, between eight and twenty meters is a lot of uh, you know and uh, a lot of area and so we we are considering either this kind of technology that you may know it's uh, it's the, the the technology that is currently being used in in Singapore with this kind of uh, floating barges for making aquaculture in the area so they would be very very um, very well very appropriate but also in the UAE because of the because of the of the um, the, um, the the oil the oil areas etc you have a lot of dredging you see here this is an area which is about 60 kilometers from the city and in these areas also you could practice some uh, some kinds of aquaculture of course it's not going to be the same technologies uh, because the currents are not so are not so good for 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 the water exchange etc but still there are some possibilities so we are trying to develop uh, a, a bunch of different technologies and propose this to the to the to the country. Uh, I have to accelerate. You have also some coastal aquaculture. Uh, here is the big uh, national aquaculture group from Saudi Arabia that is producing a lot of of, uh, of shrimps. This one is in Abu Dhabi. It's uh, an island that is, uh, in fact, it's a, it's a shrimp farm on an island, uh, and it's also it's Al Jara Fisheries, which is also being handled by Dr. Kopa Kopa Kumar. Uh, the, which I mentioned already, with making some uh, recirculated aquaculture systems. But in addition to the recirculated aquaculture systems, they have this uh, this uh, shrimp uh, shrimp farm. 
some uh, an interesting examples about uh, about the the, um, the integrated aquaculture is this system which is called the seawater energy and agriculture system basically it's a recirculated system as you can see here and there is tilapia or shrimp culture here and the used water is serves to grow salicornia you know the the plant the halophyte plant that likes uh, uh, salty water and uh, and this salicornia can be eaten, but the market for food uh, consumption of, of salicornia is still a little bit limited, but it can be also used for producing uh, biofuel. And in fact, on the 16th of January of 2019, Etihad, you know, the Etihad Airways, the company, the airline uh, companies, has been operating a Boeing 787 flight from Abu Dhabi to Amsterdam by using the biofuel produced with this system. So you see there is also a, a potential uh, for this kind of, of approach. And then when it's, I talk about re recirculation, it's because the water here, instead of being, a, of releasing the water in the, in, the, in the sea, you have a mangrove planted that removes the nutrients and then the water is recirculated. And this system is also operated with solar panels. So it is uh, carbon, uh, carbon neutral. Um, okay, in the, I, I will, uh, one one uh, enabling uh, component, if you want aquaculture, is to have hatcheries, to have fingerlings. So you have a lot of hatcheries in the in the in the regions. Uh, that's not the main concern, I think, because really you have a, a lot of species and also a lot of diversity. For example, in uh, in Abu Al Abiyad in the United Arab Emirates, they have the the, the rabbit fish, they have the cobia, they have the sherry, they have the grouper, they have the the sobaiti bream, the sham, the bia, the gabit. Uh, in the and uh, in in Bahrain they they have also the the, the mangrove red snapper etc. So you see there is a huge diversity of species. The countries are not inv investing in all in the same species. There is this diversity, and I think that's one of the, this diversity of of species is one of the characteristic of the of the of the of the area of the GCC countries. Um, this is a, a project that we have currently with the government of, uh, of Bahrain. So there are different components and I don't think I have time to, to detail, but uh, one component I wanted to, to highlight uh, um, in this lecture for, for the students is the, about the, the photo period control. Uh, because the, since we are focusing a lot on the, on the native species, the native species are not cannot be reproduced during uh, throughout the throughout the, um, the year. They have a reproductive seasons, which is generally around uh, around uh, March March to May June, depending depending on the species. And uh, if we want to to make the aquaculture production profitable, then we need to be able to produce them throughout the year. So one component that we do, and uh, the, in this case with the expert, our expert, which is Mr. Remy Riku is to work on the photo period control and uh, and uh, and um, and the temperature control you know that the, there is a natural cycle of uh, of the daylight the duration of the of the daylight and also of the temperature of water and in fact by using artificial lighting in tanks like this and also by controlling the temperature of the water we can create uh, recreate the se the same seasonal variation that we have in the in the wild but with a time lag and like this we can the, we can uh, progressively adapt the species, and they start uh, spawning in different part of the year. And uh, and if we have enough stocks, then we can have uh, fry production throughout the year. So that's one of the part of the work that we are doing in the, in the regions to sustain the permanent uh, production of fry for the for the native species. Speaking of the feed. Uh, I think that's uh, maybe the limiting factor because uh, right now there is only one uh, big uh, feed producer in Saudi Arabia, uh, which is producing feeds for hamur, sebum, sibas, tilapia, catfish, and carps, paname shrimps. But it needs to be imported in in most countries. So it means that there is a high cost. There is also a preservation issue because you know the temperature is very high, and sometimes the the custom clearance can take uh, many weeks. So uh, the the quality. And particularly the nutritional quality of the feed is not necessarily uh, guaranteed, and uh, so that's that may be one of the critical uh, issues. Uh, I will make a short break after this uh, this slide because, of course, uh, I imagine you are interested to speak about the COVID-19. Uh, we know that COVID-19 has had a major impact on fish supply chain globally and uh, and locally, but in fact, uh, in the GCC, the, the the countries have been able to manage 
quite well the crisis so far. Of course, it had a cost, but the consumers have not been really affected. The price has not has not increased. The exporters were were affected. The market, also the Oreca markets, the the you know the restaurants and the and the hotels have been. Uh, affected for some time, but now they are operating again, so they, they, the crisis uh, is over. And, uh, and some small producers, in fact, uh, particularly the tilapia, the small tilapia producers commented that uh, because there were less imports of tilapia from other countries, then it was good for, good for them. Uh, one of the reasons uh, for, for this success is that the, the countries have been able to mobilize their airlines uh, to ensure that the, 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 the supply of, of, uh, of fish was maintained, but also there has been a lot of digital innovations observed. And in fact, that's, uh, that's uh, now I would like to make a, a, another short break, uh, Dr. Salim, because we have a video of one example of this kind of uh, digital innovation, which is in Oman. Uh, in fact, in Oman to avoid um, the public auctions where the people could be contaminated, they have developed a digital auction system. And that's uh, what uh, uh, this value shows. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lionel. Yes, uh, we'll take a break for this video. And this shows how the, the GCC countries are uh, looking forward to digitalize or bring innovative technologies to the aquaculture sector. So here it goes. Thanks. Uh, that was a short video. Uh, thank you. Continue, yeah. Yes, thank you. But I'm going because I see that uh, it's really, uh, really time. So, and I want to answer the question. So, I'm going to conclude uh, very quickly on the on my last slides about the challenges. The main uh, the main challenges ahead. Uh, th there are some challenges at the at the national level uh, because, as I said. We don't want to have, you know, as uh, the, this one boom and bust dynamics, you know, where you have a production of a species and then the production turns to zero. So we need to really have a, an in-depth understanding of the development. And uh, there are also some uh, challenges at the, at the regional uh, level, uh, because all the countries, for example, they are investing in training centers. So it's, it might be interesting to have exchanges between the countries and the students to make sure uh, that they, 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 the, 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 the training is giving a, a good uh, opportunity. And I think it also may be good to exchange with other regions like, uh, I, I mean, AIT is clearly, clearly an, uh, a reference for, the, for this. And also there is a need to, uh, to invest, I think, in biosecurity because, for example, uh, the countries, are, as I said, they, you have a lot of hatcheries everywhere in the regions and some countries are importing fry from one country to another one. And so today the, the risk of the biosecurity risk is, is, is very, very limited because the production is, is limited. So there is not, I'm not very concerned about the risk today, but in the future, if aquaculture develops, this might be, become a, a problem. So it's better to start implementing biosecurity uh, precautions today when it's still time and to make to do this at the, at the regional level. 
One tool that exists, uh, I want, just wanted to highlight this, is the, the RECO fee. I mentioned the RECO fee a few minutes ago, you know, about the, the fisheries, because they are, they are helping the countries manage the, the shared uh, stocks at the Gulf level. But there is also a, a working group on aquaculture that is being chaired by uh, my friend and, uh, and colleague, the, Dr. Dawood al Ayayay from, uh, from Oman. And that's one uh, good thing. The last thing I wanted to mention uh, very quickly is about the markets. Uh, this is the salmon that you can buy in Abu Dhabi. I've been buying salmon in Abu Dhabi, and you can see that, in fact, you have very different price depending on the, on the certifications. The imported salmon from Norway and Scotland is uh, less, is uh, 27 and 33 dollar, uh, American dollar per kg. But the Irish uh, salmon, which is, in fact, organic, it's an organic certified uh, salmon. It sold fifty-four dollar, and the local, the domestic, uh, the domestic salmon. In fact, it sold fifty dollars because it is also it has also an organic certification. So it's clear that uh, that uh, the certification, organic certification, and uh, well, organic or any kind of certification is is uh, is an area very interesting for the producers in the GCC to invest to to give uh, added value to their to their product. Uh, my last slide is just an advertisement. You know that FAO is publishing every five years six regional reviews on aquaculture development, status, and trades. And in fact, the next batch will be released next week, and there will be webinars. So I'm just making some advertisement to to about if you're interested to see the 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 the, the, the review either for the for the GCC countries, but also it can be for Asia Pacific or other any other any all the other regions of the world, you are welcome to, to, to attend it. And these are the links for the reference that I was mentioning, and you can uh, see. And so thank you very much. Sorry for being a little bit longer than I, I was expecting, but uh, I, I would be happy now to, to answer the other questions. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lionel. That is not long, but that is very useful. A uh, lot of information, I think, uh, all our participants should have been uh, benefited greatly. Uh, there are a few questions coming in. Uh, maybe let me start with uh, uh, asking a very general question that one of our participants is uh, posing. Uh, what about aquaculture? Is it uh, aquaculture, does it pose, uh, impose any pressure on the seas? Because at FAO, you are best placed to answer that question. Yeah. How? Uh, Yes, yes, def, def, you know, aquaculture is like a, a, any technology. You can make a good aquaculture or you can make not good, not so good aquaculture. Uh, the purpose of the code of conduct for responsible fisheries is to, to, uh, to, to, to show how we, we can do uh, responsible aquaculture. Today, if you look at the, at the global pictures uh, from the, from the, both the fisheries and aquaculture, you can see that, um, there is hope, I think, for fisheries to, to increase the production because there you have you still have uh, some stocks that are uh, under uh, underfished, and to some for, from a point of view of food security, an underfished stock means that we are losing some food. There would be more there would be uh, f um, uh, more food if we can exploit those those uh, those, uh, those stocks that are underexploited. So. If, but at the same time, we don't want also to overfish. It is important that we stop the overfishing. So by making a res responsible fisheries management system, uh, you can reduce and hopefully not overfish anymore uh, some, uh, some, uh, some the overfish stocks. And you can increase the production from the fish that are under, from the stocks that are underfish. So you can produce more fish from the, from the, from the oceans. However, we must be realistic we cannot, we, the, the, the capture fisheries will not be able to cope with the future demand. The future demand will result from the, from the demographic growth and from, the, from the, the consumption, the average consumption per capita, and it will increase. And even if we can produce more from capture fisheries, we will need aquaculture to, uh, to complement the system. But of course, aquaculture can have uh, an impact if it is based, for example, on fish meal and fish oils. But first of all, we need to, to not forget that aquaculture is not just about fed species. It's also about uh, filter feeding oysters, mussels, seaweeds. You know, seaweeds is becoming increasingly a consumed, a directly consumed product. It's not just for the processing. So first of all, aquaculture, the, the component of the non-fed aquaculture must be 
uh, recognized. And when it comes to the Fed, uh, Fed aquaculture, it is my feeling that today the, the innovations and the technologies that are emerging everywhere in the world uh, go toward always uh, less you uh, reduced use of fish meal and fish oil in the in the feeds so yes we can i think we can uh, we can there is a there is a potential and i think we can make aquaculture that is not uh, putting uh, excessive pressure in, in the in the sea addition but again it's about respecting uh, respecting uh, uh, principles and standards for doing this perfect yeah thank you uh, there's a specific question on the gcc countries uh, you know, comparing the GCC countries, which country has the greatest potential? I know it is not very easy to make a comparison, but which are the countries that perform well and then the, uh, how FIO works with these countries to support their aquaculture sector? Yes, so um, in fact, FAO is working with almost all, all the countries. Right now, we have intensive, uh, intensive work with uh, United Arab Emirates, and um, and Bahrain, these are the two countries where we we have active uh, project, but uh, we have some uh, some studies also in uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, and also in Oman. We we used to have particularly the, all the work on aquaponics was was done in, in Oman. With regards to the potential, I would say it's um, of course the the biggest countries have have more opportunities. Uh, a, a small country like Bahrain, which we are supporting, which has a very strong potential for aquaculture, but it's a small country. Uh, so it means they don't have, as I mentioned, they don't have a lot of freshwater. So, they, so the potential of freshwater aquaculture is limited. But they have also a problem be, is that being an island, it's very difficult to, the, the land, land is a, is a constraint. For example, we cannot make uh, uh, fish ponds along the coast. I, I have seen that we, we have someone from Nakwa, uh, Saudi Arabia, which is a very, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, companies in, in aquaculture in, in the regions. But this model, for example, of pond aquaculture is not possible in Bahrain because simply there is no land. However, for countries like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, it is possible there is availability of land. So this, uh, this I would say that's the, that's the limit. The limit is this one, is about the, the potentiality of the country. But in terms of potential, uh, I mean the, the the resource of the country, but in terms of potential, I think they're, they're all the countries are very, very, very uh, endowed for this. Yeah, and then FAO has a great role connecting them together. And and uh, there is a question on the aquaponics because you have shown several interesting slides on the aquaponics, the economics, and how uh, uh, how you know profitable is aquaponic systems. There, the economics is always a problem for aqu aquaponics. So how is it uh, working in the GCC countries? So uh, in the GCC country, it's working quite well for the small, uh, what they call, what the people call small produ produ producers. So that is to say, those producers that have a, pr uh, a production target of about, uh, I would say, 12 to 30 tons uh, per, uh, per, um, uh, per year. I don't know of smaller, you know, you know, in, in some countries, uh, you have a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, small producers, uh, homemade uh, aquaponic systems. I don't think that they, right now you have a lot of technology like this in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the UAE, and you don't have also the, the big producer. The big producers uh, are investing in, in recirculated aquaculture systems because it, it is becoming too complex to handle both the hydroponics and the aquaculture. So it has a very strong potential, and I would say in the at the medium medium scale size, small and uh, yes, medium scale, medium scale. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's true. And then coming up, coming to the big producers, for example, there are two specific questions on Kuwait and Oman. How these countries are uh, you know performing? Uh, in terms of, for example, uh, is there any large-scale private farms working in Kuwait, producing crustaceans and mollusks? And also, how is the cage farming going in, in Oman? Okay. Uh, so in, in Kuwait, I, I've not been traveling yet to Kuwait because unfortunately, I, I, when I arrived in the regions, I was not the only one to arrive in the regions. There was also the COVID-19 that arrived in the regions. And I have not been able to travel to, to Kuwait. So I only know by, by documents the situation in Kuwait. What I can see that in Kuwait, 
um, you have a, a, re, a quite uh, quite sustainable, or I think quite resilient production of tilapia, probably more than other, other countries. Uh, but I have the feeling that the, the authorities are not looking to invest so much into the in, into the species uh, right now. But it's still it's still uh, yes, it, it, it is an existing uh, an interesting uh, interesting uh, area because it, it helps to contribute to food security and also to to build the economies of scales that the countries needs. In addition to this, there is a lot of interest from the Kuwait uh, government in marine aquaculture. And yes, uh, as you, as you say, there is a lot of investment. There is also uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, I, I could be wrong because I, I have not been there, but if I'm not wrong, there is also a tender right now for projects of marine cage aquaculture uh, off the coast of, uh, of Kuwait. And definitely, yes, so otherwise, yes, Kuwait is, uh, is also a country that has a, a lot of, a lot of, of potential. Um, I know that the Kuwait uh, in the past has been uh, one of the leading areas in developing technologies. Uh, and I hope that in the future, yes, there will be a possibility. I think it's very important to, right now, what we need is to have a, to sustain the production of the species over over the over the long term. When it comes to Oman, yes, Oman has also made uh, an impressive work uh, uh, at the level of uh, of the of the government to develop all you know this, uh, just by the book. You know, uh, they have developed their 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 policy and, and aquaculture strategy. As it is in the books, uh, for it, uh, the aquaculture in uh, in Musandam is relatively recent, so I can I don't have uh, data to tell you about the, the performance uh, specifically. But as far as I know, it's right now working quite well, and I have no doubts because the 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 the, the you know Musandam, as I told you, it's uh, it's uh, it's very near to the border with the United Arab Emirates. And uh, there are also some some cage fish farm in the in this area, but on the on the United Arab Emirates, and they are, they are performing very well. So they, I I think that's the case in uh, in Sanda also. Yeah, is there any tuna cage farming there? Uh, or how is the tuna? Uh, no, 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 no. There isn't. Or oh, not that I know at least. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, and then uh... yeah, so the main species in cage. Sorry, the main species in cage is uh, is the is the uh, the sea bream. The European Sibir, yep. Gilded Sibir. Okay, and uh, the ornamental fishes, because that's a different question. Uh, is there any ornamental fish industry booming uh, in terms of production? You know, consumption or uh, uh, import will be there, but how is the local production? No, there there isn't, and I think that that's uh, that's an area the the, the country should should uh, should consider because there is a, also a very good potential, particularly you know with because they they are, they can play a, a role as a hub with uh, with the airlines you know Dubai Airport or Abu Dhabi Airports there are hubs and and for the market of ornamental which is a, a highly traded commodity I think they they have a huge potential but as far as I know there isn't uh, today. Yeah. And, and uh, you made an interesting point because feed is a limiting factor. So what makes uh, the feed industry, uh, you know, performing so low? Why there is no much local production? I think it's because there is no, not yet so many producers. Uh, so you have, you have uh, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia with 72,000 tons. So they have uh, their fishing, they have uh, the a feed industry. And you have the United Arab Emirates. They are right now about approximately 4,000 tons of, uh, of fish annually, with the expectations to grow in, in a few years by uh, about 30,000 tons, which is, uh, I think, uh, achievable for the, for the country with considering the, the investment. Uh, today, with 4,000, they don't have, it's not, it seems that it's not yet sufficient for, uh, for uh, investing, but there are plans. I know that there are plans uh, right now for, for investing in, uh, in fish, uh, fish feed plants, but today, Today, there there isn't. Yeah, and what about the bioflock systems? Uh, have they been well developed in the desert region? No, it it is an area that we we have been proposing, uh, particularly uh, with the when the with the the, the expertise of uh, Dr. Pantanella. But so so far, it has not been uh, no, it has not been used. Okay, I think uh, we are. We have a few more questions coming up about the government support. Yes. The governments, how do they support the aquaculture industry in the in the region? So um, there, there, there are different levels. For example, I, I just saw uh, in Saudi Arabia, 
that the the, the funding of um, so, the, so the, the, the the government are supporting with dif in different at different levels. They are supporting, of course, with the research. Uh, they are supporting with the the regulatory frameworks, uh, particularly for biosecurity. A lot of work has been done, for example, in in uh, in Saudi Arabia with uh, with uh, biosecurity. Um, there is a, oh I can see that the, the my friend uh, Dawood is uh, from Oman is here so if you have some questions about maybe we can give him the the floor in a few uh, few minutes because he can also talk about uh, Oman but uh, okay and they they are supporting so with the planning the the planning uh, planning uh, aquaculture uh, and also with the funding because uh, you have. Um, you have uh, some uh, funding uh, institutions uh, that can provide yes uh, funding for the for the operators. And I have seen the very last week, I think, or two weeks ago in Saudi Arabia, that the the foundations in charge of uh, of funding agriculture can fund up to ninety percent of the cost of the of the of the commercial uh, commercial uh, agriculture. Beside this, you have also the. Um, the demonstration uh, demonstration unit uh, working with the industry on on solving the on solving the the their constraints. That's typically the kind of work that we have here in the UAE. We are working with the government, but we are also working with the industry and uh, and the three of us. We try to solve the the issues that the the, the, the investors are facing. Okay, great. I think uh, it will be interesting if Mr. Dawood wants to speak, uh, say a few words, but. Yeah, before that, I have a, one interesting question coming in. Uh, maybe I'll take only the last two questions. So this one is uh, how the uh, imported fish versus uh, the locally produced fish, is it profitable? Because uh, it's, uh, you know, it's so difficult to produce in the, in the desert, but imported fish could be cheaper sometimes. So how does it... Uh, uh, I, I think that as of... As of today, uh, but you have two kind of of, of of imported fish. You have the the fish imported from the region, particularly from Oman, because you, you, as I mentioned, uh, Oman is the big fish producers and the v big fish exporters. So they are exporting fish to uh, to, for example, in the to the United Arab Emirates, and these are the fish that the people are, are used to consume. So uh, I'm not going to talk about this one because it's more about it's you know the competition between aquaculture and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, fisheries, but when it comes to comparing the imports uh, from aquaculture products with the imports um, from uh, from uh, uh, with the, the local production of, of fish, either it's not either it's not the same species. For example, there is a lot of tilapia imported, but the, the, the aquaculture production of tilapia is generally sold locally, very close to the farms, and it's not really going to the markets where you, you find the imported tilapia. Uh, or it is um, you have a quality certification that is said that it is acknowledged uh, that the the local product as a as a premium because it is fresh because it is produced locally and typically that's the the price I, I showed you about the the salmons uh, between the, the the locally produced salmon and the, the imported salmon so you can see that the imported salmon in fact is much cheaper than the than the than the locally produced salmon but still the locally produced salmons because it is certified it can uh, it can uh, it can uh, compete uh, very well with the with the producers yeah great uh, yeah before we go to the last uh, question do you want anyone of your colleagues or friends to speak Lionel? Uh, in fact i don't know exactly who is here but uh, i don't know if my, my yes my my uh, that, that would uh, do you want i mentioned the the work uh, the um, that you are chairing the the working group on aquaculture and also there is this this question about Musandam. Uh, I don't know if you you have some about this. Yes, uh, Lionel. Uh, thank you. I'm Dawood Lahiyai, uh, DG of Fisheries Research in Oman. I'm also the chairman of the Rikofi Working Group on Aquaculture. Thank you, Lionel, for this very nice presentation. And actually, you give our status in GCC Aquaculture. Musandam is uh, even they call the Norway of the East. Because it's like it's, it looks like Norway for the deep fissure along the coast, and it's very suitable for the cages. And that project you show, it is uh, we started as a, a development project to convince the fishermen and the local people about aquaculture, because you know as many people around the world they think that aquaculture can com uh, uh, compete with their traditions and their fishing and the areas. 
so that we establish this project to convince them and also to show that aquaculture can produce fish, can also provide the employment for their uh, sons and, and families. And uh, it, is, it goes well now. And I think uh, in one or, in, uh, the harvesting will be in next uh, June. It is a very small project, just uh, four cages now. But inshallah, in the future, it will increase and also uh, expand to other Gulf area or, or uh, to other lagoons in, uh, in Musandam area. In general, uh, Oman also support aquaculture. Government give uh, a very commitment support. We have a national uh, plan to develop uh, aquaculture to, uh, to by 2040 to produce 200,000 ton. Uh, and this, uh, and this uh, plan was done with the FAO, as you know. And we are on this, we're with, in this regard, we want to thank FAO for this help. And uh, things going well among the GCC country. We have the GCC Futures Committee. We have the Recofi organization. All these platforms mean allow us in GCC to collaborate, to share the experience, to share the knowledge, uh, so that because we are dealing with the same water body, so what, would, what, what is done in one country can affect the other country, so we are organizing well among us. And that's the situation. And thank you. I don't want to take a lot of time. I know that uh, it's already been a long time for the lecture. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Dawood. Thank you very much, Dawood. Thank you. Good. Uh, so, yeah, I think we are almost, uh, we didn't exceed much time. Yes, perfect. And I have a, one last question for you to uh, final. Uh, uh, someone asked about the future outlook uh, of aquaculture in the entire GCC region and uh, uh, what kind of cooperation strategies uh, that exist among the GCC countries? Uh, among, or is there any ongoing projects that they cooperate together or uh, there is, is there any kind of yeah. communication among these countries? Yes, yes, there is. A, there is project. In fact, um, uh, uh, in, in fact, the, the, the working group on aquaculture um, that is being chaired by by Dawood is probably one of the of the of the of the good examples. And in, for for the people who might be interested, on on next Monday, uh, the Recofi uh, will be organizing a, a training on on fish health and biosecurity in the GCC country. Uh, so that could be maybe of interest for you. So I, I think right now the, the work, uh, uh, the, cooperation, the cooperation between the country is, uh, is uh, about knowledge exchange uh, and training, capacity building in, in the field of aquaculture. Okay, great. Thank you. We are almost uh, coming to the close of this session. Uh, <laughs> excellent presentation, Dr. Lionel. And uh, before we close, uh, I must thank all the participants. And also, I have, a, I have an announcement of the next uh, event, which will be held next month in October. So we are organizing the BioFlow uh, training again on a virtual mode. Uh, you know, someone asked about BioFlow in the desert. And uh, yes, we, we could uh, see this uh, on a virtual mode next month from 23 to 25 on three days. So this is an experiment how we can do it virtually. Uh, and we have the uh, world's renowned uh, bioflock uh, experts, right from Professor Yoram, Professor Saki Samoka, uh, Dr. Victoria, I think Dr. Victoria is known to Saudi because in the na national aquaculture and Dr. Lok Tran, all those experts come together on this three days forum. So please check our website at the aitaquaculture.org at the bottom of this slide. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, a big thanks again for all of you, uh, especially to Dr. Lionel for giving his time and effort for this, such an exhaustive presentation, giving a big cross-section of the, uh, the fisheries and aquaculture practices, the sustainable practices, the innovations and whatnot. Uh, yeah, thanks again. And uh, uh, all their favorite colleagues and the colleagues in the fisheries uh, ministry of GCC countries who are present here. And uh, also, especially to Mr. Dawood, so making his, uh, final comments and uh, the cooperation with other countries. So uh, let us say goodbye at this moment. And uh, please join us again. And uh, uh, I will be posting this in the YouTube uh, uh, stream, send you the link for all the participants 
and also share the presentation, a copy of the presentation, so that it will be most useful to all of you. So thank you. And uh, uh, it has been a long, uh, long uh, session. And uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, please stay safe. Take care. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Kapung krap. Thank you very much. Thank you and bye-bye. Take care. Have a good day.